In 1178, a group of five monks in the city of Canterbury saw a very, very strange phenomena. And, of course, monks, during the High Middle Ages, were also scholars. And so, of course, they recorded what they saw, a phenomena that really should never have been witnessed by anybody in recorded human history because of just how unlikely it was. I'm going to go ahead and relate the account to you right now, assuming I can see it. This year on the 18th of June, when the moon, a slim crescent, first became visible, a marvelous phenomenon was seen by several men who were watching it. Suddenly, the upper horn of the crescent was split in two. From the midpoint of the division, a flaming torch sprang up, spewing out over a considerable distance fire, hot coals, and sparks. The body of the moon, which was below, writhed like a wounded snake. This happened a dozen times or more, and when the moon returned to normal, the whole crescent took on a blackish appearance. Now, of course, these days we'd be inclined to think that this was just the ramblings of some group of superstitious men who thought they saw something in the sky and wrote it down, but really they were either making it up to justify some sort of massacre, some sort of witch hunt, something along those lines, even though witch hunts were extremely uncommon in the 1100s, almost unheard of. That was more of a phenomenon of the Renaissance, the more enlightened time, supposedly, in history. But regardless, some have taken it a lot more seriously. Some have wondered what this could have been? What could have happened on the moon to create a phenomena like this? In 1976, an astronomer came up with a pretty compelling scenario, that a sizable asteroid impacted the side of the moon, which faces the earth, creating a very visible flash, a darkening of the moon when all of the debris from the impact was kicked up, and a phenomena that scared the daylights out of these five men to a degree to where they felt compelled to report it and not only record it but also to testify all five of them that they had indeed seen it and that they weren't just making this up an oath that was a very very serious thing to religious men of the 12th century now of course since then Some astronomers have debated or disputed whether this is indeed the case. There is actually a crater located on the moon in the area where the flash was seen that corresponds, a relatively recent crater, by the way, that corresponds to what the monks reported, a crater that has very visible ejecta blankets and such, unlike most of the sizable craters on the surface of the moon. So it does seem to correspond, and also a measurement that was made of the wobble or the vibrating that the moon should have experienced as a result of an impact of this magnitude, that also seems to be there. But at the same time, there are some very significant problems with this scenario as well. One of the biggest problems is the sort of thing that would also happen if the asteroid Apophis were to strike the moon as well. And that is the fact that the civilizations of the world were not subsequently thrown into chaos by a far more frightening and far more consequential phenomenon that should have occurred within a few days of this event happening, and something that would definitely occur again if Apophis or any other sizable asteroid were to strike the moon in our time, something that should be taken very seriously, and something that NASA should be watching for just as vigilantly as they are watching for sizable asteroids that may be endangering our planet. (music) 
I think it's fair to say that even those of us that only take a casual glance at the moon every now and then would know that impacts on this body are nothing new. You can tell by the vast number of craters on the surface of the moon, and most of these craters were formed when our natural satellite was rather young, a huge ball of magma with a thin layer of regolith on top of it, magma that was exposed any time a sizable asteroid crashed into the moon, which happened on a pretty regular basis during the early days of the solar system. As a result, huge regions of the moon became exposed oceans of magma that lasted for many thousands or perhaps even millions of years, regions of the moon that we can still see today as darker patches on the surface of our natural satellite as opposed to the brighter areas where these impacts did not occur. That is where there was all of this exposed magma and therefore a more blackened and geologically different region of the moon than the areas that were not impacted in the same way. And then, once the moon became older and the magma core eventually cooled, subsequent impacts were not nearly so violent, did not create these massive magma oceans, and so resulted in far less obvious craters. Craters that still result in this pockmarked lunar surface that we are so familiar with today, but not quite so drastic as the ones that were created during the early evolution of the moon. Tycho Crater, for example, is an example of one of the more recent craters. However, it is extremely unlikely, even with a far more frequent asteroid impacts taking place on the moon, because the moon has no atmosphere to interfere with impacts, that we would have seen anything visual, that there would have been a violent enough impact on the lunar surface to be actually noticed by the 12th century Canterbury monks. The odds are about a thousand to one that something like this would actually transpire. And yet there is physical evidence that something like this might have happened back in 1178. This is the Giordano Bruno crater, which exists in roughly the same area that the monks reported to have seen this bright flash. It is a 22 kilometer diameter impact crater on the side of the moon that corresponds to what was observed, and it is a very recent crater. We can tell because of the bright material that radiates out from the crater, material that should have disappeared by now if this crater were substantially older. However, the crater isn't exactly the right age. It is estimated that it's anywhere from a million to five million years old. The odds of it being much more recent and the measurements being off are approximated at being much less than 1%. So not entirely certain as to whether this makes sense, but at the same time, there should also be a corresponding wobble or vibrating motion that the moon is experiencing right now if an impact like this did indeed take place in recent history. And measurements made of the moon utilizing laser beams bouncing off the moon's surface suggest that there is indeed a wobble or vibration suggesting a recent impact by a very large body. At the same time, however, the vibration is too significant, suggesting that something else might be causing it. For example, magma activity beneath the moon's surface that we thought at one time might be completely inactive, but now it seems there may be a lot more subsurface geological activity going on beneath the moon's surface than we previously thought. But 20 years ago, Paul Withers, a graduate student at the University of Arizona, brought up the biggest problem with this theory, and that is what didn't happen after this event was recorded, and something that definitely should have been recorded by somebody if this impact did indeed occur during the High Middle Ages. An impact of this magnitude an impact strong enough to dig a 22 kilometer crater would also have catapulted 10 million metric tons of debris into Earth's atmosphere that would have arrived about a week to two weeks after the impact. 
it is difficult to comprehend just how big of an impact something like this would have on our own planet, given the fact that the moon is hundreds of millions of kilometers away, but it would indeed. According to Withers, quote, I calculate that this would cause a week-long meteor storm comparable to the peak of the 1966 Leonids. And by the way, that particular meteor storm created thousands of observable meteors within a space of 50 15 minutes. So we're talking about a week long meteor storm at that level of activity, something that would have utterly terrified the civilizations of the time, regardless of where they were on the planet, and certainly somebody would have reported that. Now, the vast majority of this material would be very tiny, only a few centimeters in diameter, or perhaps even fragments smaller than that but not all of it. Some of the fragments would doubtlessly be big enough to survive an entry through our atmosphere and also probably would have created a fair amount of havoc on the Earth's surface during this incredible meteor storm event. So again, compelling reasons to believe that this event actually didn't take place in the Middle Ages as some astronomers have supposed. But of course, this also brings to rise another question. What would happen if an asteroid like Apophis struck the surface of the moon during our age? Well, the answer is something very similar indeed. Even though Apophis would not dig the same kind of crater as whatever dug the Giordano Bruno crater, it would still be approximately six to seven kilometers in diameter, and the force of the explosion would be on the level of four gigatons. 4,000 megatons. And by the way, if anybody is still doubting the significance of an Apophis impact on our own planet, 4,000 megatons would be more than enough of an explosion to throw enough debris into the atmosphere to create a very significant nuclear winter if we were unfortunate enough to experience an Apophis impact. But again, if an impact like this were to strike the moon instead, granted, it wouldn't be as serious as an impact on our own planet, but still, millions and millions of tons of debris would be hurled at the Earth, and some of it would not be all that tiny. Keep in mind that we are talking about an explosion that it is at least the equivalent of 200,000 Hiroshima bombs transpiring on a body that has one-sixth the gravity of our own planet. Lots and lots of debris would achieve lunar escape velocity and would be subsequently captured by the gravity of our own planet dragging thousands if not millions of fragments of debris towards our planet towards an inevitable impact. Again, the vast majority of it would be very, very small, but some of it would definitely survive to reach the surface. Probably nothing large enough to destroy a city, although it's hard to tell for certain, but definitely large enough to be life-threatening if it were to land in the wrong place. And by the way, this is the most compelling reason why we shouldn't be using nuclear weapons to destroy incoming asteroids. It turns one very dangerous object into thousands, if not millions, of smaller dangerous objects, sometimes creating a much wider range of devastation than one would experience from a single object. Object. So, is this likely to happen? Are we likely to have an Apophis impact on the moon? Well, no, probably not, at least not in the two most recent close approaches that we are going to experience from Apophis. It's going to come a lot closer to the Earth than it is to the moon. But the entire point of this video is to point out that an impact on the moon could be just as troubling for our civilization. We need to remain vigilant against such events. NASA needs to remain vigilant not only against objects approaching our planet, but also objects approaching our natural satellite as well. Both could be quite problematic, and we should also come up with scenarios and plans for deflecting asteroids that might be closing in on either the moon or the Earth. And also, if we deflect an object, a potentially hazardous object, away from our planet, we need to make sure that we don't inadvertently hit the moon in the process. And it's not just restricted to the moon as well. 
any large object hitting Mars could potentially be an issue in the future, given Mars' low gravitational pull and the fact that we've had some very close encounters with Mars in recent history. As a matter of fact, a sizable comet at least a half a kilometer in diameter called Siding Spring gave Mars a very close encounter 10 years ago, just over 100,000 kilometers away from the Red Planet. Had this impacted with Mars, it would have created chaos throughout the solar system. Because keep in mind, comets travel more than twice as fast as your typical asteroid, meaning the force of the blast would have been utterly cataclysmic and would have ejected billions of tons of debris out of Mars' gravitational influence to be scattered throughout the solar system, and some of it would invariably strike Earth. These are the sorts of impacts that we need to be vigilant about, in addition to impacts with our own planet. The solar system, especially the inner solar system, is a delicate ecosystem, just like any ecosystem on our own planet. What happens on Mars, what happens on Venus or Mercury, or even what happens in the outer solar system when Jupiter gives a helpful nudge to a comet to either drive it out of the solar system or sometimes to drive it into the inner solar system, depending on what kind of mood the Jovian planet is in, all of these things can impact us and the future of our civilization, and it's something we need to remain attentive of if we want to survive beyond the 21st century. I'd like to thank my latest Patreon supporter, Michael McIntosh. Welcome to the family. I'm going to be releasing a new Patreon exclusive video, hopefully this weekend, depending on how quickly I can recover from this nasty cold I've got right now. Apologize for all the delays in releasing content, but I'll get over this eventually. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks again for watching, and as always, stay angry about space.